Right, can everybody hear me okay? I think it should be okay online. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna talk about some cluster using uh, high performance cluster computing. And just this is a really gentle introduction to it for anybody who's thinking about, oh, maybe I could use this, um, but maybe it's a bit intimidated. This is just kind of to say it's not that hard. I'll give you the kind of basic building blocks of it for uh, for our cluster here at York, which is called uh, Viking. And um, this connects with uh, with Mary's talk earlier, uh, where she was talking about using the, the cluster. It could be a really good way of doing stuff like value of information analysis when it's not really feasible otherwise. So, sorry, yes. I, I'm not sure if people in the waiting room are getting in. Okay. Well, I can keep talking. You can keep talking. All right, cool. Okay. <laughs> so, well, one question would be like, well, why would you bother learning uh, to use the cluster? It has got a steep learning curve. Like the first model you run on it, it'll take you a good while to actually get it running at all. It, there's lots of weird jargon, slurm, login, node, all the rest of it. And you need to interact with an operating system that's not Windows or, uh, or uh, like Apple's uh, OX. So you need to interact with like Linux, which is kind of weird and we're not really used to it if we're not computer scientists. But I think that the main thing is that it's got huge potential increases in computational power. Um, Excel, you know, or uh, Excel to or that's a jump or to cluster, that's another jump I would say of similar magnitude. So it's really, you could, it opens up the possibility for doing stuff that wouldn't be feasible otherwise like uh, individual patient simulations, sometimes required value of information, distributional cost effectiveness, these things can be computationally heavy. Uh, is that gone? Okay, so first thing is like, what is it? It's also help, always helpful to get a concrete idea. Here's some pictures of the actual York cluster. So it looks kind of as you'd expect, like just a big computer. And the whole idea of a cluster is just like, it's a load of, I imagine it like a big room full of laptops but they're all, you can control all of them. They, they work as a single system. So imagine thousands and thousands of laptops, but you can use them as a single system. And the computational increases are huge. Uh, imagine you've got to run a PSA, a thousand PSA samples, and it takes 30 minutes per sample. If you were to just do it sequentially on your laptop, you do run one, that would take you 30 minutes. Then you do run two, that would take you another 30 minutes, so an hour. Then run three, 1.5 hours. You add it all up, it's going to be 500 hours or 21 days. Okay, that's a long, long time. It's possible, but you know, you're tying up a computer for that long. It's not, you know, if you need to change anything, it mightn't be feasible. If you do it on a cluster, you get a lot of parallelization. So imagine you now have a thousand computers and you run all of them. You start on the first computer, we're doing some, uh, PSA one, second computer, PSA two, on and on and on. The thousand one does the thousand PSA. They all run simultaneously. It takes you 30 minutes to get your answer. So 21 days versus 30 minutes. So that's really a big, a big deal in terms of computation. So we have our in-house, I developed an in-house guide to, to using the Viking, which is our cluster. And this is basically because uh, uh, James Love Coe, an old colleague of mine, he gave me some code and then I started to use it. And I was like, okay, well, I need to learn how to use this. I might document it for myself in the future and for others um, if they want to use it. And the basic idea is that there is a wiki, there's like a wiki for the Viking, for the cluster here at York, but it's very general. It's, it, you know, it has to talk to physicists and climate modelers and everything, all the things they might possibly do. And also computer scientists who might be interested in this stuff for its own sake, which we're kind of not, we just want to use it for our, uh, our decision modeling essentially. So I've re kind of written a sort of need to know guide that just is written for decision modelers and with sample code that helps you run a PSA, which is the usual basic loop, which is, you can generalize this to VOI, but it gives you the basic idea. Um, the, the, the guide is, and my talk will be mainly for Windows users and for the York cluster, but this is generalizable. You know, there's little tweaks if you're a window, if you're a Apple user or a Mac user and, um, other clusters might work slightly differently, but this operating system of Slurm should a lot of them work on that and Unix. So there's a number of steps uh, to run a PSA on Viking. That's what I'm going to talk about today. And um, this kind of can be divided into setup and then actually running it. 
uh, due to time constraints today, and in order to kind of give you a flavor and kind of dig into the details a bit, I'm not going to talk about setup or show you much around that. But the basic idea is, and this is in the user guide, you set up the Viking user account, you set up a VPN if you're accessing it, accessing it from your home rather than in the university. This is important because when I started using it, it was COVID, so it was all work from home. So you needed a VPN to actually get inside the university. Um, and then you need an app, which on Windows is called Putty. This is the way that you talk to Viking, right? I'll, I'll show you pictures in a minute, so this won't be too scary. And then you need a, to download the app to transfer files to and from Viking, right? This is WinSCP. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. It's not scary at all either. So once you have those things done, then you can start running a function multiple times, which is your basic PSA idea. And that has four steps, which we're going to go through today. First, you take your R script and you adapt it, right? You just need to do some little tweaks on your R script, nothing too scary. Then you write a, what's called a shell script, which has some kind of reusable code, just tiny little tweaks every time you do something different. Then you run the shell script, which I'll show you how to do. And then you just download your results. You take your results from Viking, which imagine we've got a room full of thousands of laptops. Actually, that's in, in um, the physical location of Viking is near Leeds. So you need to take those your results from that location and put them onto your desktop or onto your Google Drive or something like that. So you need to take your files from those laptops and bring them home, right? And then that's that's just a small step. So we'll start with uh, the setup. So here is what Putty looks like. So when you want to talk to Viking, if you want to tell it to do stuff, this is how you need to tell it to do stuff. So on Windows, you point and click. Here, you type. So you can see the cursor there. Uh, which is when you're going to send in little commands to change working directory or find this file or run this file, right? So that's how you talk to Viking, tell it to do stuff. Here is an example of when you've got your results and you want to transfer files to and from Viking. So this is when the SCP, it's really simple. So all it is is on the left panel there, that's my, my actual laptop, my, my C drive that's on my laptop that I'm working on uh, in front of me. And then on the right panel, that's the files that are on Viking, right? And if you want to get files from one to the other, you just drag and drop. So it's not scary at all. And what that's doing is it's taking the files from my location here and putting them onto the computer, which is over the cluster, which is over in Leeds, right? So it's it's very easy and it's kind of, in, it's quite quick. Right, so we'll start with our first thing. So we're gonna imagine the simplest possible model we could ever have. This is, you know, I wouldn't advise anybody uses this model. Uh, so this is our standard PSA where we have a loop, right? So I've got my object, which is PSA results, and I'm initializing that. I'm just going to run, oh, that should be a thousand. Sorry, but, uh, I'm going to initialize it with a thousand uh, missing values. And then in my PSA loop, I'm going to, for each PSA, I'm going to take the number of that PSA. So the first one multiply it by two, second one multiply it by three. Obviously this piece of code will be your actual model that will take your PSA, transform it, calculate costs and qualities, all of that is going to be in there. I'm just doing this for to keep it simple. It's extremely simple. So that's going to be how we do our PSA in our computer. Obviously, that would run really quickly in R. You wouldn't need a cluster for that, but I'm just using it for an illustration. So the first thing you need to do is you need to adapt your R script. And here, anything in red are comments, and anything in black is your actual code that you need to use. So the first thing is to set your working directory. So you're on Viking, so you've got your uh, you've got your user account, and then that's my uh, my user account name, and then this is the name of the the folder that we're going to that we're going to it, or is going to look for files and save files. Then you've got this kind of weird looking thing, but the basic idea is you just copy and paste this. The basic idea is it this remembers what iteration you're on. So in your for loop, this is your I index, right? So it just remembers what iteration you're on. And then you've got your PSA results. So this is where your model would go. So do you remember I back here, I had my model was I times two. Here it's just Viking iteration times two. And then I store my results. And then you store everything in the environment and give it a name. So this is again, just reusable code. And it's, it might look a little bit long, but it's just naming all the objects and saving them, right? So your OR script went from this to this, and your model was here, your PSA results, 
and now your model is here. So it's only just a six lines of code, five, six lines of code. Right, and then once you've adapted your OR script, you save it onto Viking, which is simply, I made my OR script on my local machine, and then I just copy and paste it, drag and drop it onto here, and now it's in Viking. The next step is to write the shell script. So here is the sort of instructions to the cluster on how to do its thing, like what you want it to do. Uh, there's a number of things I could talk about here, but I'm just going to, a lot of this is kind of standard code. You mm. wouldn't ever have to adapt it. This just tells you, it sends an email to you uh, when your job begins, ends, and fails. Here is the time you want uh, for your job. You have to tell Viking how much time is this going to take. So I'm saying, give me 20 minutes. It obviously won't take that, but you can say that. If your model takes an hour to run, you should probably put down two hours. You know, always ask for more than you need. This is your account. Here is kind of an important one. This is your, uh, your PSA. How many PSAs do you want to run? So before in our, when it was all on OR, we just put this, that was just this number here. Now we have to tell Viking how many loops it wants to do, okay? So if you want to do 10,000, you just add a zero, easy. Then you load up OR, which is some standard code. And then here is this kind of, again, scary looking thing. This is just to keep account of which uh, loop this is like your loop index. So again, it's very standard piece of script. And then you put the name of your OR script that you've adapted here. Once you have that, oh, and then you, you write that all in a text file and you just save it with dot, dot sh and it'll know that it'll save the right file type, okay? And then once you have that, you then drag and drop it over here. So here is an example of that. So you've got this dot sh, that's our shell script. And this is our .or, that's our or script. The third step then, and this is kind of like coming near the end of uh, what you need to do, is you run your Unix. You actually talk to Viking and you say, run that shell script. So the shell script is gonna call the or script. So you tell Viking, run the shell script, the shell script runs the or script. And what you need to do is you need to, again, as usual, just tell it what working directory you're working in. Here now we're using Unix, I think. So you need to tell it, give it a command CD, which is change directory. And then you just tell it the directory. So instead of pointing and clicking your way to a directory, you just have to type it. And then the second thing is you say, well, what should I run? And you say, oh, well, run our shell script. This is our dot sh. And you, use, you tell it to run it by this sbatch command. And for these commands, you just type them straight in here. So imagine if this was live, I'd type in cd scratch, enter, and then I'd type in sbatch shell underscore script dot sh. And once I've done that, Viking will say, okay, I'm going to go off and run this uh, shell script. I'm going to do exactly what you've told me here, which is to run this or script 1,000 times. <clears throat> and then hopefully, if everything's gone correctly, you'll get an email to your inbox, and it'll tell you, Job was successful, no errors, no problems, no nothing. And if that's the case, then you will get, your results will appear here with whatever you decided to name them. And there'll be a thousand entries here because of your thousand PSA samples. And once that's done, you simply just highlight those 1000 PSA samples, drag and drop them over into your local machine. And now your machine in front of you has all those results. So it's your machine in front of you, you told it to do something, It's computed over in leads in this supercomputer and now you've brought it back and you've got your results at home and that's the basic and that's the basic idea. so any questions uh, just like that. <coughs> so they are like the talking cube to ask a question or have we got any questions online no we don't have questions online i'll give you one to get started okay right. so you, you're working on a remote computer it's not your computer. You know how long it takes to do on yours. Is it? Is each individual oh, yeah. run faster or slower? It's a good cluster? question. Yeah. That I think that will depend on what your uh, cluster is like. So, well, there's two answers. So, one is the kind of standard. This is it's a big thing. So, there's a kind of trade-off you can get. You can ask for specific. So, in Leeds, there's thousands of computers, but there's a subset of really specialized ones. 
right? So there's a few thousand normal computers, and then there's a, maybe 200 really specialized ones that run really fast. But the problem is, you're not the queuing for that. You're going to have to wait longer to get access to them. You might get all 200 at once. You might get one, then another 10 minutes later, another 10 minutes later. Whereas if you just go for standard computers that are just basically as powerful as your normal desktop, you can get 500 of them immediately. That's very normal that you get 500 off the bat. Other times when there's more demands on the system, like uh, when do people like to use it? I don't know, Monday morning or something or Friday evening. Sometimes there can be uh, more constraints on it. And there you might just get 200 of the normal computers. It was still quite a lot. Uh, you said there were just 200. Yeah, I just 200. Yeah, yeah. There. But in, in other setups, so like I think in the States or if you're in um, a place that does a lot of climate modeling, I think like um, University of Anglia or Exeter do a lot of climate modeling. So they'll have even way more. They like orders of magnitude more. Whereas we have, you can standardly get about 500 at a time in New York. Any other questions? Have we got a question for you? Oh, it's dangerous. <laughs> Ready? Thanks. Um, so yeah, no, thanks for the talk. And yeah, definitely like, you know, computer clustering is a very useful tool and it's used in lots of um, research. But I guess uh, the question I had is more around, so let's say we develop models that sort of rely on sort of cluster-based computing to run our simulations and things. How does that then translate to like, HDA settings because you know we submit these models and we're sort of optimized. Maybe they're not so optimized because we we sort of rely on this clustering, clustering computing to sort of make our simulations run faster. But then maybe mm. HDA bodies don't have access to that. Like how how do you anticipate HDA bodies sort of do the same kind of thing? That's a really a really good question, and I would say generally that. You need to decide as an analyst what is the appropriate tool for the job you've got. I do more method stuff, so I don't have to worry about that part of the equation. But even then, um, say in the context of value of information, we had a bit of a discussion about it earlier. There is a whole suite of methods, these efficient methods for computing value of information, which you don't rely on the cluster, right? But if you go the kind of brute force method, like in Mary's example and some of my ones, I just threw them on the cluster. So that again becomes a, it just becomes a trade-off between, well, what is the most appropriate tool for the job that, for the situation I'm in? Because I'm used to using the cluster, often I'll just throw it on there and I can just switch my brain off and just throw a computer at it. But in other situations, it might be more appropriate to use the efficient methods to make it. If I was thinking, oh, I'm going to have to share this with people, or it's for a HDA agency, or somebody's going to have to reproduce this, then I might go down that route. So I would say it's not a kind of, um, it doesn't, it's not a silver bullet uh, by any means. But for a lot of the tasks that I'm faced with, it's really appropriate. Thank you. One question. Do you want to give your name and institution as well? No. We're actually from Mavericks. It's a consultancy company. So I just wanted to ask: once you get the uh, thousand outputs in the, in the files, uh, do you get those back into R and then and then combine it? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good. That's a really good point. So again, this is like as you get more. This is a very. Um, I wanted to make this as accessible as possible. And I made, wanted to make this code as general as possible when I give people examples for our in-house guide. So I just saved absolutely everything in my environment to an R data file. Um, and then each, each PSA is saved in a different R data file. Once you get that from the Viking, you transfer it to your home computer. You then need to open those files and combine them on your local machine. That can actually be a bit of, that can be quite slow, actually. Um, so you can do more clever things where you're maybe like, creating the matrix using on the Viking, and then you just get a single thing that contains all your results. That's possible, but it's a little bit more uh, sophisticated. So I wanted to kind of get people started easier, but all that is is really possible. And actually it can cause some issues getting your data from Viking onto your computer. If you, because you've got huge memory and huge processing power, you can sometimes forget about it. You just, oh, I'll just save everything. And then when you try to bring it back onto your computer, it's like giant and it can cause issues and then it's slow to open and it can make your computer crash because you're asking too much memory. So you start to then have to start thinking more carefully about how you save your files, what you actually need and what you don't. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. Thanks, David.